moderator today, um, Mr. Mark Gazowski, who's out in Pepper's LA office. First, I'm going to let folks know that if um, I'm putting an icon up here, audio should be streaming through your computers today, but if you're not able to hear us, um, you're able to ask for a phone connection by clicking the phone icon, and I'll give you a phone number to dial in. We're also encouraging questions. Um, can't get to all the questions today. We'll, we'll commit to getting back to you with your answers uh, after the seminar is over today, so feel free to click the Q&A button, and then we'll get the questions here. We're also happy to offer these slides as a PowerPoint um, takeaway. So at any point, feel free to hit the File button that I have highlighted here on your screen. Do a file uh, Save As, a PDF, and then you can at your own convenience and take them on your own laptop when you're ready. We're also offering uh, CLE credit today in California, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and New Jersey. If you're interested in that, I'm going to come online four times and give a uh, password that you just need to uh, write down. You can email me after the seminar is over. My email address is on the slide here, and I'll uh, give you a form to fill out with those code words, and then you'll be, uh, you'll be set. With that, I'm going to be happy to turn it over to uh, your moderator for the next hour, uh, Mr. Mark Gazowski. As I said, he's in our Los Angeles office. He's also the head of Pepper's uh, healthcare practice, healthcare services practice. And uh, Mark, uh, I'll uh, um, give it to you for the next uh, hour. Well, thank you very much, Brian, and, and thank you all for joining us. And what we will be presenting is a jam-packed update on healthcare antitrust issues. I see from the attendance list that we have attendees from Arizona, Illinois, Pennsylvania, New Mexico, Delaware, California, North Carolina, Michigan, uh, and other states uh, which uh, shall remain nameless. So we truly have a national healthcare practice and we have a national audience for this very, very important issue. And I welcome you to this program. Uh, with us today uh, are several outstanding speakers from Pepper's antitrust and commercial litigation practice who focus, among other things, on healthcare issues. And so the first speaker I'm very pleased to introduce to you is, is Jan Levine. Jan is a, a partner in our Philadelphia office. She is the co-chair of commercial litigation uh, practice. She's a very experienced uh, litigator and antitrust lawyer uh, who's handled multiple cases for healthcare entities and Jan, I must say, is an incredibly wonderful person as well as a really intelligent person, which you need to have if you're working in the very complicated area of antitrust. She received her bachelor's degree summa cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania and her law degree cum laude from Temple University. Uh, our Jan will be focusing, uh, by the way, on um, the FTC state action crusade and prospective implications of the Phoebe Putney case, as well as the North Carolina Dental Supreme Court cases, uh, which of course are very important uh, for those of us who deal with these antitrust issues. And she will be our uh, kickoff speaker. Uh, the next speaker will be Robin Sumner, and Robin is also a partner in our commercial litigation practice in uh, Philadelphia. Robin has got great antitrust experience handling antitrust issues for clients both in and outside of the healthcare space. Uh, and Robin, of course, is an incredibly intelligent person too, having graduated magna cum laude from Brown University and received her law degree from the University of California at Berkeley. Bolt Hall School of Law, where she graduated Order of the Coif. And Robin will be presenting um, on the topic after Jan with regard to topics in healthcare competition and talking about the FTC and the Department of Justice and their interesting pursuits. I should note that, of course, in this day and age of, of uh, antitrust uh, issues, we're seeing more complicated cases brought by government regulators, both at the federal and state level, and especially when we see more consolidation in healthcare after the Affordable Care Act, and as we see entities coming together, merging and building networks, that we have issues related to dominant providers and dominant, um, fee, dominant uh, entities as they move across the healthcare spectrum. We also see, of course, obviously the issue and this constant struggle and tension between competition on the one hand and affordable care and access to care on the other hand and how that is going to play out. 
The last part of our presentation, which we hope to get to, uh, is if there's time, will be Jan Levine addressing privacy as a possible emerging antitrust issue, some very novel concepts that, again, we just are going to have an opportunity to tee up. And because of the tightness of time, I should warn in advance that we probably will not be able to have any questions uh, from the audience during this conference, but we do invite and we absolutely would like you to submit questions both during the conference online as indicated, but also uh, afterwards by sending us emails. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jan Levine for the first part of our program. Jan? Well, thank you, Mark, for that nice introduction. And I am going to start with a topic that is very hot lately. Um, the Supreme Court uh, has ruled on two state action doctrine cases after a long time, really, with this doctrine being quite dormant. Uh, and these cases relate directly to health care. Um, I'm going to start with a basic uh, overview and also give you a context of how the FTC views these issues. So just quickly, uh, the state action, action doctrine really balances federal and state interests. It provides an antitrust immunity to the federal antitrust laws for actions by the state. And the state, you know, generally, or the three branches, the, you know, the, the governor, the state legislature, the courts, but it also provides that same immunity for those that act pursuant to state authority. And it's really the second part uh, where uh, courts struggle uh, on the different prongs of where that immunity applies. So the antitrust immunity extends to these um, actors, these non-sovereign actors, if two conditions are met. First, the state must clearly articulate and affirmatively express that the state intends to displace competition. The state is allowed to displace competition, but if they're going to delegate that duty, they have to be very clear. Um, and secondly, the state needs to actively supervise the conduct um, that they have delegated. And the question of who do they have to supervise and how do they supervise is really at the center uh, of these cases. The two cases that we are going to talk about today and their implications uh, deal with both prongs. The first prong was dealt with in the Phoebe Putney Health System merger case, and the second prong of active supervision was recently dealt with in the North Carolina State Board of Dental Examiners case. But by way of background, it's interesting to know that the FTC has really been focusing on the state action doctrine for over 10 years. Back in 2001, um, then FTC Chairman Tim Muras convened a state action task force to look into these issues, and its initial head was Ted Cruz, then Director of the Office of Planning Policy. And I must pause for a minute to say that it is a bit amusing that Ted Cruz was at the helm of the federal government's attack on states' rights at the time. The task force was concerned about the lax application of these prongs. And so back in 2001, there were three initiatives. One, to reaffirm the clear articulation standard, and two, to clarify and strengthen the standards for active supervision, and third, to clarify and rationalize the criteria for identifying government entities that should be subject to active supervision, because the question of which entities don't need supervision and they are only subject to prong one versus which entities need supervision is really at the heart of the struggle in the Supreme Court. All three of these goals are really met in these two cases we're going to talk about. As additional background before we talk about these cases, the FTC has had an ongoing uh, debate about occupational and professional licensing boards. They really think that they uh, act 
in anti-competitive ways and really create uh, barriers to entry. And as you can see by this slide, um, they really uh, have argued that licensing boards um, increase prices and do not necessarily improve quality. The FTC has also been on a campaign against uh, health care certificate of need laws. They see the certificate of need laws also uh, as a way of creating barriers to entry and to increase prices and lower quality rather than what they were meant to do of lower cost and increase quality. Um, the FTC particularly sees CON laws and licensing boards as suffering from the brother may I problem which is really competitors having to ask other competitors for entry into a market. And that the government compares that to the mother may I, which is correct, where you can ask your mother, i.e. the state, uh, for competition issues, but you shouldn't be uh, asking that in a competitive horizontal way. So let's look at the Phoebe merger case. I don't know how people are familiar with the actual facts, but if you don't understand the facts of the Phoebe um, case, you really cannot understand the holding. The facts are extraordinarily complicated, and they really take about a half an hour to explain, but I'm going to try to do it in 30 seconds. Um, if you follow this chart, you have the state of Georgia. The state of Georgia had a hospital authorities law. That hospital authorities law allowed for the creation of a hospital authority that really was responsible for health care. Back in 1941, the hospital authority purchased Phoebe Memorial Hospital, which had a 75% market share. The hospital authorities then set up two uh, not-for-profit but private entities, Phoebe Putney Health System and Phoebe Putney Memorial Hospital. Phoebe Putney um, Memorial Hospital, the hospital itself, was leased to the uh, not-for-profit entities, um, and the um, other hospital, Palmyra Hospital, ended up being purchased by the hospital authority, but with money from the two not-for-profit entities, and at the end of the day, Parmara Hospital was then leased back to the entities. So the two entities basically controlled both hospitals, 86% of the market. Um, this is uh, one of those setups that, uh, as a defense lawyer, you, you sort of um, are scared to look at the consultant report, and that is exactly what happened in this case. The consultant had figured this out, and in that report boasted that it had developed a proven method to avoid antitrust scrutiny by using the state action doctrine. And that document became a large part of the briefing in this case, that this setup was, was done in a way to try to get full advantage of the immunity. So with that explanation, um, you can see that the FTC wanted to block the merger. Next slide, please. Um, wanted to block the merger because there was an 86% virtual monopoly. Nobody contested that, um, and the defense was the state action, action doctrine. The issue in this case was really prong one. As you can see, it could have been a prong two um, case where the question was active supervision over those two private entities, but the FTC decided to challenge it on prong one. And you can understand that when you look at the actual statute. The question is, did the statute, did the state in the statute clearly articulate their intent to displace federal antitrust laws? And the statute allowed the hospital authority to, quote, acquire by purchase, lease, or otherwise, and to operate pro projects. And really, the simple question was, is that a clear articulation to displace competition? And the Supreme Court decided no. It was not a clear articulation, therefore no state action. 
And this is uh, Brian Dolan. Before we go to the next slide, I wanted to remind folks, if you're interested in CLE credit, we're going to give you four code words. Here's the first one. You just got to write these down and then submit them to me after the fact. The first code word is going to be PEPPER. It's P-E-P-P-E-R, and I'll come back in about 15 minutes. Thanks. Okay. Um, the court, uh, which uh, found that there was no uh, state action, it was a unanimous decision. And Justice Sotomayor sums it up in simple permission to play in the market, i.e. a general corporate statute, um, does not foresee entailing permission to roughhouse in that market. In other words, a general statute does not clearly articulate articulate and affirmatively express a desire to displace competition. Um, what is a little amusing is the postscript in this case. After the FTC fought on every level and actually won, they really won the battle but lost the war because in the end, the FTC was actually unable to achieve divestiture of the two hospitals because the state, Georgia, had a certificate of need law that meant no other hospital could acquire the, the divested Palmyra Hospital. So at the end, the FTC, this is why the FTC does not like certificate of need laws, and they continue that battle to today. So the FTC, even after Phoebe Putney, really has continued to fight uh, or go to the states and really try to um, encourage them not to pass certificate of need laws. And they also now have gone to the states to try to encourage them not to pass uh, statutes that do in fact clearly articulate. Uh, post Phoebe, statu uh, states then that wanted to be able to um, have uh, statutes that come under the state action listened and they started to clearly articulate. Uh, but post Phoebe, the FTC has actually gone to two states, and I've given you the sites there. Those letters are very interesting, urging that those, legis those legislators not pass those statutes. Next, we go to uh, North Carolina, and that is the North Carolina dentist case, and that is where uh, prong two is focused on. Uh, the background of the North Carolina case is that there was teeth whitening businesses were opening up around the state in malls, I'm sure you've seen them, offering a lower priced alternative to going to your dentist for teeth whitening. Um, North Carolina uh, has a setup with a dental board, uh, not unlike most states have a dental board. The North Carolina dental board, however, um, which is characterized as a state agency, is an eight-member board. It has six active dentists who are market participants, and they are elected by other licensed market participants. That is a very important part of this um, case. It also has one dental hygienist elected by other licensed dental hygienists and one consumer member appointed by the governor. The Facts of the North <clears throat> Dental Board case are very important to understand because when you really understand what happened, um, you get you understand more uh, what happened in this case and that had the board acted differently, this case may never have gotten at all to the Supreme uh, Court. So when you look at this case, it helps you on, on how you should advise boards to act. Um, first, the board received complaints from other dentists largely about pricing, the cheaper pricing at the malls, and there were some quality concerns as well. The board itself determined that teeth whitening fell under the practice of dentistry, and therefore teeth whitening kiosks were engaged in the unauthorized practice of medicine. But the board made that determining, which is really a legal determination, by itself. The North Carolina Dental Practice Act actually states that um, a person shall be deemed to be practicing dentistry if that person removes stains, 
accretions or deposits from the human teeth, but it's really silent about whether teeth whitening even constitutes the practice of dentistry, and if it doesn't, the board really had no jurisdiction to begin with. Uh, under the Act, the board actually is authorized to promulgate rules and regulations governing the practice of dentistry, provided that they are not inconsistent with uh, the Act and are reviewed by the North Carolina Rules Review Commission. That was not done in this case. The Act also provides that if the board suspects an individual engaging in acts that are the unlicensed pr uh, practice of dentistry, it may bring an action in state court or refer to the district attorney. That was not done. And because those two things were not done, what happened next is that the board just took action on its own. Instead of going to a court, they decided on their own to send out cease and desist letters to um, about 29 non-dentist providers and also to the malls. They included threats of potential criminal consequences. And North Carolina had no role in reviewing the cease and desist letters. And in the argument before the Supreme Court, the fact that this board on their own sent out cease and desist letters and did not go to a court first was very troubling to the justices that voted for the majority. I'm going to skip the next two slides. It explains the FTC challenge and the board's justifications. You can read them. It really goes through what happened at the argument. But I want to get to the holding and the implications. Um, the majority opinion was written by Kennedy, joined by Robert Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and uh, Justice Kagan. And the court held that the board was not immune from the antitrust laws because the board was not actively supervised. And really, the substance of their, their thinking was you can't have form over substance. Just because you call it a state board doesn't make it a state board. And that it was pretty clear here that um, these were not sovereign actors, that these were private participants, and they had dual allegiances. They had allegiance to their own personal um, market concerns and allegiance, uh, we are sure, uh, about being a state agency. Um, but the court was very troubled about this action and made a determination that a state board on which a controlling number of decision makers are active market participants in the occupation, um, in the occupation, the board regulates must satisfy the active supervision. So this board uh, fell under prong two and there was no active supervision, so there was no um, state, state um, action immunity. So the important thing is uh, really where does that leave us? And the, the majority opinion helps us with that, and also the FTC helps us with that. First, the board reminded everybody that the state can indemnify these individuals from damages. So, you know, you can make sure that individuals are indemnified. Um, secondly, uh, the court talked about what active supervision and explained it need not be a, a you know a detailed day by day involvement. You needed realistic insurance that the non sovereign actions were pursuant to state policy. Um, supervisors. Uh, state supervisors are required to review the substance of anti-competitive decisions and not merely just the form, the procedures. And a state supervisor may not be an active participant. The FTC uh, post the decision um, on the next slide obviously has been trying to give um, advice about how to set up boards um, and the FTC has actually relied on information, too, and suggestions in a, uh, in a, a Mickey brief, and one in particular went through different things that can be done that I think are very important. First of all, a licensing board can be supervised by a single state government employee that sits on the board. That is the Rhode Island model. Um, even more simply, there can be a single individual in the governor's office who really oversees a group of related boards. 
Uh, another structure can be a board might be placed with the state executive agency and the head of the agency would review and sign off on action. Or all of the state boards could be placed in a single central umbrella agency, uh, which not only provides administrative support, but also limited substantive supervision on policy issues. And these suggestions in some of the briefs are already done by many of the states. So really the FTC and I think the majority opinion were saying there has to be tinkering, but not major overhaul. However, the dissent <clears throat> um, written by Alito and joined by uh, Justice Scalia and Thomas were very, very concerned essentially about a slippery slope argument that they felt that once there was a delegation, once prong one is met, that is the end of the story. If the state is going to um, delegate to a state agency, then the federal government has nothing more to say about it. And they really see this as problematic because it is really the federal government questioning that delegation and how that delegation works and where will it stop. And there was a number of questions, as you can see on the slide, that the court um, uh, raised, the, the dissent raised. And in the argument, <laughs> Justice Scalia, you know, really made the point, don't you want brain surgeons regulating brain surgeons? Do you want really the state to be involved, some state bureaucrat, to tell brain surgeons uh, how to license others? And so um, I think that the majority listened to that but felt that the North Carolina board um, really took such extreme actions that they really should be reined in a little bit and really there had to be more active supervision. And with that, we will turn to Robin. Actually, I'm gonna jump in before, if that's okay. Um, this is Brian Dolan. To let folks know if you're interested in this, silly, if you came in a little late, I am gonna give some code words. Here's the first one, um, was pepper. The second is gonna be health, that's H-E-A-L-T-H. And I'll come back in um, 15 minutes with the next one. In the meantime, we'll give it over to uh, Robin. Okay, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Jan. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, a trend that we're starting to see in um, healthcare consolidation, and that is whether the government will challenge the so-called cross-market consolidation that we're starting to see with more frequency and what those challenges might look like and what we can do to sort of preempt those challenges as we are in the sort of wait and see pattern. So just to um, rewind a little bit, in the 1990s, the government lost multiple hospital physician merger cases. And in those cases, the government's approach was to prove anti-competitive harm by establishing undue market power in a relevant geographic market. And the problem the government kept running into was with the definition of that geographic market. There were many instances where the claimed geographic market was so ridiculously small and, con and concentrated and needed to be small to be concentrated that the um, courts just rejected the challenge out of hand. In others, the government faced the problem, sort of the other side of that coin, that if they could establish a relevant market, they couldn't show market power in that market. So after a string of losses, the government changed its approach. And it undertook some studies about anti-competitive effects in healthcare markets where consolidation was occurring. And as a result of those studies, what happened was the government moved away from defining a relevant geographic market based on patient inflows and outflows toward focusing more on the actual anti-competitive effects in the market and proving direct anti-competitive effects, in particular by looking at how the proposed acquisition affected the ability of health insurers to negotiate with providers when forming provider networks. And that change was important because it precipitated a winning streak in challenges to healthcare consolidation that continues today. And the case that really affected this sea change was the Evanston case 
in 2004. And there the FTC sought to unwind an acquisition that had combined three hospitals in the affluent Chicago suburbs. And the government theory was based on evidence that following the acquisition, Evanston was able to charge health insurers far above what comparable hospitals could charge for general acute care hospital services. This was really the first case rejecting the traditional patient-centric approach to market definition that focused on where patients could go in the face of a price increase or how far patients would travel to avoid a price increase for healthcare services, and instead focused directly on the merged entity's increased bargaining power with health plans and competition among hospitals for inclusion in those all-important provider networks. It worked, and that's been the FTC's approach ever since, followed by several additional wins, either in the courts or by forcing the abandonment of a proposed merger. And culminating, I think, most recently in the Ninth Circuit victory in the St. Louis case. So we fast forward to the present, and look at St. Luke's, there there was the acquisition of an independent physician practice group that was challenged on the ground that it would create a single dominant provider of primary care physicians in the market and give St. Luke's the power to demand higher prices. The FTC challenged that merger both on the grounds that it would enable the merged entities to negotiate higher reimbursement rates from health plans for primary care physician services as well as for ancillary services. The Ninth Circuit agreed, but not totally, finding the FTC was able to prove its theory with respect to the primary care physician services, but questioning or finding a failure of proof on the ancillary services market. Perhaps more importantly, though, the Ninth Circuit rejected the efficiencies defense that the hospitals put forward in that case and in fact questioned whether one even exists. What the Ninth Circuit ultimately concluded that in any event, whether the efficiencies defense was viable in certain circumstances, it certainly wasn't viable here because the claimed efficiencies moving from the fee-based to value-based payment model and the um, concomitant imp um, improvements in quality and reductions in costs were not specific in the St. Luke's case to the merger, but rather could be achieved without actual merger or financial consolidation. And what's important, I think, with the St. Luke's case and what sets up the discussion that we're going to have this afternoon is that before St. Luke's, the analysis had always focused in these cases on the effect on competition in a single market for the merged services. With St. Luke's, we saw the FTC reaching beyond that single product market and suggesting that there was a, an anti-competitive impact in a related but different market for ancillary services. And even though the Ninth Circuit found a failure of proof in that regard, the idea or theory was put out there. So what we have seen recently is that there have been increasing, there have been rumblings with increasing frequency about a new wrinkle in healthcare consolidation, and that is cross-market mergers. With increasing frequency, we're seeing the government and economists raising concerns about possible anti-competitive effects of cross-market consolidation in healthcare. So you might ask what's meant by cross-market consolidation, and it's at least three things. Consolidation in non-overlapping geographic markets. So examples there would be city hospitals acquiring suburban or rural ones, or hospitals in different cities and even different states merging and forming one integrated health system. It's consolidation in non-overlapping product markets. So here we see hospitals acquiring input markets like in the St. Luke's case, physician offices, ambulatory care centers, outpatient centers, and also hospitals acquiring output markets like skilled nursing facilities and post-acute care treatment centers. And the third area is consolidation of providers and insurers. These are where we're starting to see health systems running 
Medicare Advantage plans or offering their own plans in insurance exchanges or health systems contracting directly with employers for plans. Traditionally, these types of consolidation have evaded antitrust scrutiny. They've been viewed largely as exercises in vertical integration with generally neutral to beneficial impacts on competition. But we've seen the government expressing concern about these sorts of consolidations in multiple fora recently. And there's sort of two key concerns that we see the government focusing on, market foreclosure and increased leverage. Some examples of the foreclosure concern are in April of 2012, the Department of Justice issued a statement in the context of the Highmark West Penn investigation. And you may recall that the issue there was a concern about Highmark's acquisition of two hospitals, Allegheny General and West Penn, to create the Allegheny Health Network and compete with UPMC, which had its own health insurance plan in that market. And the expressed concern here was a view that vertical agreements, such as the affiliation agreement between Highmark and the two hospitals, can reduce competition by limiting entry or expansion by third parties. And to sort of distill that down, the issue is a concern about hospitals without the ability to participate in a health plan provider network because there are no available insurers operating in the market to contract with, or insurers without the option to include providers in their network because all of the providers have already entered into exclusive arrangements with available insurers. We've also seen evidence of this foreclosure concern in a statement that was made by Deborah Feinstein, the director of the FTC's Bureau of Competition, in a statement she made about a year ago at the Fifth National Accountable Care Organization Summit. And there she echoed what we saw the DOJ previewing back in 2012, which is this concern about hospitals acquiring all physicians in certain specialties and foreclosing a competing hospital's avail availability to offer those services because the competing hospital can't access the needs of physicians. We also see a concern about leverage being expressed with more frequency, and this was a theme, I think, that the government regulators um, examined over and over again at the two-day workshop that was held by the FCC in February of 2015 on examining healthcare competition. And here the concern is simply that these instances of cross-market consolidation lead to more leverage in the consolidated entity and increase that entity's ability to both negotiate higher prices in single markets, but more importantly, across multiple markets, and increase their, that increased leverage in market power clearly has the ability in the government's view in the right circumstance to adversely affect competition. There's no doubt that this cross-market consolidation is happening with increasing frequency. Since the passage of the Affordable Care Act, the number of hospital mergers is up shortly, sharply. And there's a reason for that. And I think that reason is the belief among providers, certainly, that scale is needed to transition from the fee-for-service model to a value-based payment model that is encouraged by the Affordable Care Act and rewards cost savings, efficiency, and quality. There's a feeling among providers or a belief among providers that in order to offer and manage the continuum of care that's required to transition to the value-based payment model, you need consolidation or financial integration. The consolidation promotes access to capital that's needed to support the technology enhancements that are required in a value-based payment model, that inefficiencies are reduced and thereby costs are reduced, and that leverage is afforded in negotiations, which is important to providers as they move to value-based payment because they need to 
be able to negotiate a value-based payment structure that's going to be sustainable into the future. Many have questioned, though, whether most hospital systems actually need to consolidate to successfully integrate care and achieve cost savings, efficiency, and quality enhancements that are encouraged by the Affordable Care Act. I think the government, courts, and economists are generally coming down on the side of answering that question with the word no, that financial integration or actual consolidation isn't necessary, and the exception that may be recognized across the board on both sides of this debate is a system that lacks any sort of appreciable scale and is so significantly capital constrained that its continued viability is really dependent on the ability to find a merger partner. But outside of that sort of extreme situation, the government and economists, and to some extent the courts, I think you see this in the St. Luke's case, are saying that we don't necessarily buy that consolidation is required to achieve the kind of clinical integration that is encouraged. Hospitals and providers, on the other hand, seem to be answering that question still with a resounding yes for the reasons that we just discussed. There's no doubt also that, when, that in this consolidation, it's happening across geographic markets. Between 2000 and 2012, approximately half of all hospital mergers have involved hospitals in different core-based statistical areas, which are the upper limits on traditionally, what we think of as the traditionally relevant geographic market. And 15% of those hospital mergers have involved hospitals in different states. We also know for sure that consolidation is occurring across products product markets with the hospital physician consolidation perhaps being the most prolific. And that's being driven by a number of things, but really I think first and foremost is this desire to achieve the clinical integration that's required as providers transition to value-based payment models. Medicare payments increase for hospital employed physicians and the consolidation with hospital and physician groups does provide access to much needed investment capital to thrive under value-based payment systems. While physician employment by hospitals is certainly up, it's really probably only at about 25% of all physicians who are employed by hospitals today, despite some widespread belief and reports in the popular press that that number is greater and reaches about two-thirds. And finally, in the third area, we are certainly also seeing increases in insurer-provider consolidation. That is certainly happening with more frequency, so much so that the term the Kaiserification of American healthcare has been coined. And that consolidation is driven first and foremost by the desire to manage risk. With increased enrollment by government healthcare beneficiaries in HMO type plans like Medicare Advantage and certain Medicaid plans where there's a flat fee per patient, insurers are certainly feeling that if they're going to take on that risk, they want direct control of the provider. There's also a desire, I think, both on the parts of the providers and the insurers to increase their leverage in negotiation, and the concern there goes right with this idea of avoiding lockout, where a hospital doesn't want to be left with no insurers or health plans to join, and insurers don't want to be left without access to hospitals to put in their networks. But at the same time, there's a feeling that if they have a guaranteed partner, they're not going to be forced into additional arrangements where the fee structure may not be desirable because they have a guaranteed partner. Robin, this is uh, Brian Dolan. Just wanted to jump in again and let folks know that we are going to give the next CLE word. The third is going to be law, L-A-W. So again, you need to write down the three CLE words so far. First one was pepper, second one was health, third was law. Robin, all back to you. 
Thank you, Brian. And so this all leads us into what are the potential anti-competitive effects of these cross-market consolidations that we think that the government will focus on as it has made clear that these arrangements are not going to fly under the radar and avoid any scrutiny at all in the antitrust arena. Perhaps the most complicated one to talk about is the cross-geographic consolidation, so we'll tackle that one first. The standard model is that combinations in the same geographic market result in fewer options and increased price and other contract concessions that providers can demand. Translating that kind of concern into cross-geographic consolidation is more complicated than it might appear, and the cross-geographic phenomenon is currently the subject of study and was discussed somewhat extensively by Professor Lee Moore Daphne at the FTC workshops in February. And she identified two possible theories of harm that are under review and consideration right now the common customer theory and the common insurer theory. And at a very high level, the common customer theory is simply that if the same customers value providers in different, different geographic markets, the combination of those providers can lessen competition for their inclusion in health plans. The idea here being that when they come together as a bundle, the competition may be adversely affected because in one market, the inclusion of that provider may be an absolute necessity for any health plan. It may be so dominant or there may not be enough competition that it absolutely has to come in. And once that provider is bundled with a provider in a different geographic market, there is this concern that if that separate geographic market has a somewhat more robust competitive atmosphere that could be adversely affected by the um, joining with the hospital in the less competitive market and plans may be forced to kind of take both or take neither um, situation where if they have to take the provider in market A, they're necessarily going to take the provider in market B and what's really sort of under consideration is that effect on market B and whether that's something that the regulators should be focused on. Under the common insurer effect, the idea is that if the same insurers negotiate with both providers, the combination of the providers can affect the bargaining negotiation. And the impact or effect on competition here is a little more ambiguous because the insurer is sort of in the middle of the equation between the providers and the health plans or the ultimate customers of the healthcare services. And while the insurer might have less leverage with providers who are consolidated across geographic markets, it might gain some benefits from that consolidation by being able to offer a more attractive option and thus actually have more leverage with the health plans or the purchasers. One way this might work is the ability to engage in cross-market price subsidization where by offering a lower price in one market where the demand curve is very elastic to attract more purchasers in that market and at the same time increase price in the other geographic market where the demand curve may be less elastic. And in instances where that kind of cross-market price subsidization occurs, the overall impact on competition is complicated and something that is being looked at pretty closely right now. So the data that we have available now certainly suggests that these cross-geographic mergers do result in higher prices. But to what extent and whether that has an overall adverse impact on competition is something that's being looked at closely um, by economists, by um, people in the academic field, and I'm sure um, by the government. And the government is watching those analyses carefully as it considers how to look at these combinations and whether to challenge them in the future. 
The potential competitive harms on the cross-product consolidation are a lot easier to understand. There's two key effects here, which can occur either singularly or in tandem, and they're the leverage effect and the foreclosure effect. The leverage effect is simple. This is the idea that if you're going from nine physician groups negotiating for inclusion in networks to two, the um, power for the providers goes up in the bargaining negotiation and the power for or the leverage that insurers and health plans have decreased. And the concern here that's being, I think, um, considered with a lot more seriousness and scrutiny than it has been in the past is the possibility to extend that leverage outside of the particular product market like the market for primary care physicians, for example, that we saw in the St. Luke's case, and extend it into other product markets that these large consolidated systems are offering and leveraging the ability to extract concessions beyond increases in price like exclusivity provisions, for example, which may harm competition. The foreclosure effect is simply that if a hospital A acquires all of the oncology providers in the area, hospital B will be foreclosed from offering oncology services because it will have no oncologist to turn to and to include in its offerings to its patients. The issue here is how courts are going to view the market for oncologists. If you follow the traditional sort of Tampa Electric and its progeny cases, which cast markets like the market for oncologists as nationwide markets, it's, I think, early to speculate as to whether the government will be successful in drawing these markets more locally so that it's actually able to gain some traction with the foreclosure um, argument. But again, the data that is now available suggests that the efficiencies or pro-competitive effects of these cross-market consolidations might not be realized or necessarily result from financial integration, and we touched on this a little bit before. After St. Luke's, it's unclear whether and to what extent the efficiencies matter, particularly where the overarching pro-competitive justification is clinical integration if it can be achieved without financial integration, which some studies suggest it can be, that um, pro-competitive justification is probably not enough if courts follow the St. Luke's court's reasoning to outweigh the impacts on price. And the final area here, which I'm just going to touch on very briefly because it, it's very similar to the cross-product market consolidation are the potential anti-competitive harms with provider-insurer consolidation. Again, this, these um, theories follow closely the leverage theory and the foreclosure theory, the idea being that fewer providers might be available for inclusion in provider networks, fewer networks might be open to providers for inclusion, and with less overall competition, the leverage is going to increase significantly for providers and insurers as they deal with health plans and their customers. So the open question, I think, um, that we all need to give some more thought to is what level of scrutiny, if any, will be afforded these increasingly common cross-market consolidations? Will the government move forward? It certainly has told everyone that it is looking at them, that there should not be an expectation that financial integration, if it's more vertical in nature, will go unnoticed, or if it's cross-market integration, it will go unnoticed. And I think what we all can do as we're sort of in this holding pattern is make sure that as we're contemplating these transactions, we're thorough and we're creative. We need to focus on the efficiencies, the lower costs, and the improved quality that are the pro-competitive justifications for these combinations and not assume that they're going to carry the day, but take the time to generate the backup and really justify how the combination is going to achieve those and is, in fact, 
necessary to achieve those pro-competitive benefits. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Jan for a few minutes to talk about privacy as an emerging antitrust issue. Actually, before Jan finishes us taking home, I wanted to give that fourth word out for folks looking for that. The fourth CLE word is going to be trust, T-R-U-S-T. So again, it's pepper, health, law, and trust. Those are the words for the CLE credit. Thanks, Jan. Okay, we are just going to sum up because what health care panel could not talk about privacy? Um, and it is uh, an interesting issue about whether privacy, as we all know, privacy is no longer just, you know, an IT issue. It is at the very heart of many products um, and at the heart of uh, health care. Um, the FTC has started to consider the possible effect of privacy issues on actually economic efficiencies and competition. Although the FTC really warns that consumer privacy protection is really best accomplished by consumer protection laws, you know, such as HIPAA, high tech, and the other consumer laws. So they do not mean at all, and they actually warn against displacement of that focus on privacy. But because privacy is starting to be so important, um, the FTC has started to think about privacy in a different way, and that is privacy could be viewed as a form of non-price competition. And where that could come into play is really in merger analysis and in certain agreements, because if you look at big data, um, you know, there are companies that gather data, and if you have them merge, um, do you get dominance uh, in that area, and should we be looking at data now as an asset or a commercial good? The other area is really a merger's effect on competition in terms of privacy policies and technology. As you know, when you buy a, a, a any kind of technology now, even when you go into a hospital, there are privacy policies, and the technology to support those privacy uh, policies um, is an asset. And the question is, if you start merging, will um, that lessen the beneficial privacy policies and technology because uh, you would no longer have to compete with each other for those policies? So that's what the FTC is starting to consider. Um, I must say that Al Franken um, gave a speech back in 2002 12 and really forecasted this and felt very strongly expressed a, a, a real concern about dominant market players having less incentives to give consumers meaningful choices in terms of privacy. And uh, an interesting quote from that speech is, privacy rights can be a casualty of anti-competitive practices. And he was really talking about sort of the Googles and the Facebooks of this world that, you know, when they become so big and everybody wants to join them and there aren't a lot of alternatives, then um, if there's dominance in that area, the privacy practices can be reduced rather than increased. And in, in this world, uh, that is a concern. So taking those thoughts and really thinking about them in the healthcare um, context. Um, it's interesting to think about. There certainly has not been a case, but um, in thinking it through, you know, in negotiating uh, hospital mergers, there is a value to a hospitals or a health systems privacy technology and protections. Um, as you know, that is something that is now valued and thought about highly um, in healthcare institutions. Um, and when you're valuing um, a merger, uh, you could argue strongly that that is a pro-competitive aspect, that if you merge, you will have better um, technology and privacy policies because those are expensive, certainly. Um, or it could be viewed as anti-competitive because depending on the market, um, will the two merge entities not have to care so much? about their privacy policies and technology because there really is no other place for patients to go. Uh, the other issue um, 
not necessarily a true antitrust issue, but an issue in an emerged entity. When um, there is a merger, you have to develop an integration strategy to maintain high standards for the protection of patient information. You know, if one hospital or healthcare entity prom promises A, and then there's a merger with B, you know, what happens to those promises um, originally when um, the patient uh, came to the healthcare entity? So those are just some of the issues that this whole privacy um, area could be in um, antitrust analysis. And just in one minute, um, uh, on our invitation, we had talked about HIPAA and privacy litigation, and we've uh, added some slides. I think you all know what HIPAA is. HIPAA is protected information. We've gone through the covered entities. And um, as you know, HIPAA does not create a private cause of action. Uh, HSS, through the Office of Civil Rights, is really the main enforcer. Um, the Department of Justice can impose criminal penalties. The state's attorney generals um, can bring actions under HIPAA, but individuals can't. The next two slides, which you can look through yourself, are really, there are some very stiff regulatory enforcements uh, against uh, hospitals and healthcare entities and plans. I've pulled some of the more recent ones for you. But finally, um, what I did want to point out to you is that even though HIPAA, there is no private cause of action under HIPAA, HIPAA is creeping into these both data breach class actions and individual privacy cases. Uh, Plaintiffs certainly know not to just have a HIPAA cause of action because that would throw up, get thrown out, but for negligence per se, breach of implied contract, invasion of privacy, intentional infliction of emotional distress, HIPAA standards are being used for the duty and the standard of care. So even though you don't call it a HIPAA cause of action, HIPAA is finding itself into these cases. And on the breach of implied contract, your privacy policies, if you go too far and guarantee them, you may undercut the no private right of action of HIPAA by guaranteeing HIPAA in a contract case. Um, and I've given you two uh, recent state opinions where the courts did find, they didn't throw out the claims, they found that state common law claims of invasion of privacy can be based on a HIPAA created duty and standard. And more to come on that in the future. Well, thank you, Jan. Thank you, Robin. I think I speak on behalf of Mark and myself um, for really appreciating the amount of time you put into this presentation for our listeners for the last uh, hour. We went a little bit over. What I'm going to do for our attendees is just throw on my email address on the screen for a couple reasons. One, if you wanted that CLE form, you can email me. I'll, I'll keep it on here as we leave today. But also, if you had any questions that we're not going to be able to get to right now, you can email them to me, and I will um, submit them to the speakers. With that, I'll leave this, my email address on there, and I will thank everyone for their time they gave us today. Thank you. <laughs>